Hey, there we go. Server side development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Those of you whom, who may have heard me talking at the DevOps days uh, heard me uh, proclaiming uh, that the configuration management tools are doomed. So they may be doomed, but they're not dead yet. And uh, the, the truth is there are many of us still uh, planning on using the configuration management tools, still not ready for the grids. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, a few words about me, uh, Anton Weiss. Uh, people usually call me Ant Weiss. Uh, uh, this is my email, Twitter handle. Uh, and I consult, I help people with uh, continuous delivery, software delivery in general and DevOps at Automato. Uh, feel free to connect. So uh, the, this is a DevOps track, and uh, why are we even talking about tools? You know, because we started with weapons, and weapons are tools of war. Because, you know, people rightfully say, and I certainly do believe so, DevOps is not about tools. DevOps is about human communication, human interaction, the way that we work with each other, but tools do definitely help in this communication, in these work processes. And you could even say that DevOps is all about tools. It's about uh, building the tools that help us work with other people. And in line with what uh, is uh, incorrectly attributed to Marshall McLuhan, we shape our tools and only then our tools shape us. So we... If we want to enable DevOps in our organizations, we should probably start with the tools, and that will bring the DevOps with it, if such a thing as DevOps even exists. Uh, interesting, by the way, Marshall McLuhan uh, wasn't talking about uh, software. He was a media and communication professor, so that brings us back to the issue of communication. And then there's the law of instrument. Uh, who have heard of the law of instrument? Well, that's pretty easy. It was uh, formulized by two Abrams. Uh, first by Abraham Kaplan, and then in a more concise manner by Abraham Maslow, who I think most of us heard of. And it says, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So, Tools, they don't only define the way that we communicate, they also define the way that we see our world. And uh, sometimes it's uh, enabling us to do things in a different manner, and sometimes it's limiting us to doing things in a specific way. Uh, so if tools can be limiting, uh, should we even be to using tools? Um, I say we certainly do. I have a personal experience. I used to think I could open uh, beer bottles with my teeth and it worked until I broke a tooth one day. And since then, <laughs> I always use an opener. So tools, uh, are good because they can save us time, they can save us money, and they can save us health. Okay, so if we're going to be looking at four different tools today and trying to decide on which one to use, we should have some criteria regarding what kind of tool is a good tool. Uh, I, I've listed a few criteria here. You can add your own, of course. But I think the good tool is the one we're comfortable with. 
comfortable, okay? Uh, a tool that's flexible enough that will allow us uh, more than one uh, specific use case. Uh, something we could easily extend to do additional things. Something that's scalable that allows us to start with small tasks and go to larger tasks. Uh, we're talking about open source software uh, configuration tools, so it should have a wide community support. And of course, it should be easy to integrate it into our existing stack. By the way, the issue of being comfortable with the tool is something that uh, sometimes, again, limits us to staying with the tools that we already know, instead of switching to something that may be better. Okay, so w what are those tools that we'll be talking about today? I call them the weapons of mass configuration. They solve uh, uh, the new, you know, relatively new problems that appeared uh, in, in the last decade when we suddenly found ourselves uh, having to manage configurations of not one and not a dozen, not even a hundred, but thousands of servers. Uh, they allow for automation orchestration by managing infrastructure as code. And uh, they all fall under the same category of uh, so-called desired state configuration management. So they allow us to define a desired state in which we want our servers to be, and then to enforce that state, and, uh, and also verify that that's that's the state okay without further ado let's start with our first contestant and that would be puppet the oldest of the bunch it appeared back in 2005 a long long time ago uh, raise your hand if you haven't even started working in 2005 well a few of us okay I already worked in, in high-tech back then, but I didn't even uh, think that such a tool was needed back then, I think. Okay, so uh, in 2005 it was written in Ruby, and it still is written in Ruby. It's developed by Puppet Labs. Uh, it defines configuration in its own specific uh, declarative language. It's uh, JSON-like, you could say. Uh, it used to be possible to write configurations in pure Ruby, but it's been deprecated for the last couple of versions. And uh, uh, it's model-driven. According to Puppet Labs, uh, Puppet is uh, able to manage more than 10 million nodes. Uh, this is a... Typical topology of uh, Puppet uh, setup. So we have uh, Puppet Master, which is the central point of truth and the central point of failure. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it uh, pulls its configuration from a code repository. Its infrastructure is code, as we said. And uh, there are the, the slaves of the master, the Puppet agents, which uh, receive their configuration in a pool mode uh, over uh, HTTPS, it's XML RPC over HTTPS, uh, and then they report their state back to the master. So as we said, this is pool mode, so agents uh, in a scheduled time intervals, they just wake up and go to the master to ask if there's any new configuration for them. Uh, although you could also uh, use a, a Puppet push feature, but it's not a typical uh, configuration. So what are the Puppet-based concepts? Well, first of all, it talks about resources. I think actually all, all these tools uh, talk about resources, but I suppose Puppet were there first. So uh, uh, they should be credited for, for the using the word. Uh, the resources of the system are files, services, packages, users, cron jobs, etc., etc. Puppet uh, programs, uh, which uh, define the, the configuration, are called manifests. 
and uh, you could uh, group your resource definitions in classes, which allows you to group resources that uh, uh, define specific system functionality. And uh, you can package your classes in modules. And uh, of course, the community provides us with a lot of modules. Uh, Puppet Forge, which is Puppet Module Repository, and now uh, has more than 4,000 community modules. So definitely, the the criteria of community support here is very strong. Uh, so Puppet basically gives us configuration management. If we go for Puppet Enterprise, uh, we also get automatic discovery and orchestration with the help of M Collective. And uh, we can uh, also do bare metal provisioning using uh, accompanying tools, uh, one of which is Foreman, uh, which is a, a machine data center management tool developed uh, uh, originally by Reddit here in Israel. And since Reddit 7.1, I think, it's the, the official uh, uh, machine management tool for Reddit. And it works in very tight integration with Puppet. Okay, and Puppet also have their own bare metal provisioning tool, which is called Razor. So, if you're not only configuring cloud instances, this this is uh, something that's nice to know. This is a sample of Puppet code. Okay, this is the way it looks. Here we have a class that does uh, a simple act of uh, installing an NTP package and writing some configuration into etcntp.conf and then running the uh, running the ntp service now if we're looking for a tool that we will be comfortable with uh, it's good to have a, a nice web ui so we'll be looking at the web ui options for each one of the tools Regarding Puppet, we have, of course, the, the commercial option of Puppet Enterprise, which is actually free f if you're running configuration for less than 10 nodes. Uh, and again, you have the option of using Foreman, which is uh, open source and free and has very tight integration with Puppet. And there's also another open source tool called, called Puppet Board, which is only used for reporting. Uh, in a nutshell, Puppet is probably the most mature of the four reviewed because of the mileage. Uh, by default works in pool mode of operation. Uh, it has uh, strongly developed enterprise features. Uh, role-based access, reporting, audit, uh, strong Windows support, if uh, that matters for you. Uh, you could say that the, the ecosystem for Puppet is the largest. Again, Foreman is a good example of that. Uh, on the downside, this is a language of its own, something you'll have to learn from scratch. Uh, it may be seen as less flexible than other tools because of the, the language uh, and uh, it is pretty easy to get started with but uh, gets a bit uh, quite a bit more complicated if, as you as we move further along okay the next uh, contestant is chef uh, it came around in 2009 by the way i didn't ask who of you is already using any configuration management tool? Okay, more, more or less anyone, <laughs> everyone. So who is using Puppet? Okay, and who is using Chef? Okay, a lot of Chef. I'm not an expert in Chef, so correct me if I get anything wrong. Uh, but Chef has been around in 2009. It's uh, written, originally was written in Ruby, but then uh, many parts were written in Erlang. Uh, developed by Chef, formerly called Opscode. 
And uh, its configuration, the way we configure the servers, is written in uh, pure Ruby DSL, and uh, that makes it procedural and not declarative. So this is a chef topology taken from uh, their uh, site. So it's a bit more complicated than the Puppet uh, setup. Uh, we have the chef server, which is the, the central point of truth. And uh, we have the chef client nodes that are pulling the configuration. But uh, in addition to that, we need the, this thing uh, at the bottom, which is the chef uh, workstation, where we develop our chef configuration and uh, where the chef development kit has to be installed on and the, the tool that's called Knife, which we uh, upload the configuration with. Um, Chef also talks about resources, system resources. Uh, Chef programs are called recipes, and more or less all the terminology uh, is around uh, kitchen. So uh, recipes with their data uh, are grouped into cookbooks and uh, there's also the, the data bags which are used for uh, storing the global variables and accessing the variables and uh, Chef uses uh, roles for uh, grouping configuration to our servers and Chef uh, uh, cookbook repository is called Supermarket and it has uh, more than 2,000 community cookbooks which is uh, quite a bit less than what Puppet have. Okay, this is uh, uh, an example of chef code. So you can see it's Ruby. And this does more or less what the first example did. Installs NTP, configures it, and starts the service. Uh, regarding UI, uh, there used to be an open source web UI, but it's now deprecated. So the only option for Chef, at least as, as far as I know, uh, is the Enterprise Chef Management Console. Uh, you have to pay for it. Uh, I think they, they also have it free until a certain amount of nodes. How many? Okay, ah, so it's free for any amount of nodes, but without features, just to look, <laughs> to look at things, but don't touch. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Nobody uses the free version. Anybody, do, do you use the, the commercial version? Anybody here? Okay, so <laughs> probably there is no real justification for using the commercial web UI. Okay, <laughs> so Chef in a nutshell, it's, uh, it is pretty flexible because you can write Ruby code and uh, uh, that makes it powerful. Uh, it does have enterprise features if uh, you buy the enterprise features. Um, it using Ruby as a configuration language probably makes the, the learning curves uh, steeper. And it's not, also, not, so, not only Ruby, but also the, the setup is pretty complicated. Uh, I'm talking from my uh, own experience. I did some POC of using Chef, and it was a pain to get started with. Uh, but a lot of people are using it, so they do find it a useful tool. Probably if you already have some previous uh, knowledge of Ruby, it will be a good tool for you. And it also works in Pulmoid by default uh, with push available. And this brings us to our next contestant, which is Ansible. It's the youngest of the bunch who uses Ansible. I expected to see more, honestly, because it's been taking the, the industry by storm since it's appeared. 
And the reason for that is uh, their motto, simple IT automation. Okay, so they're not talking about desired state configuration management only. They're saying we can make IT automation a simple task and they mostly do perform on the promise. Uh, it's developed originally by Ansible Works, but this has been acquired by Reddit recently. Uh, it's written in Python, so if you're a Pythonista, this could probably be a better fit for you. And its configuration is written in pretty simple YAML plus Jinja templating. This is the Ansible topology, so the, the main difference of Ansible uh, is that it, it's agentless. It doesn't require you to install any agent component on any of the, of the nodes. All that you need is having the SSH access to the nodes in order to, being, to be able to manage the, them. Uh, so you have the controlling machine. It should have the code, the codi codified infrastructure. You run the Ansible commands or Ansible playbooks on the nodes and they report back uh, their state. Uh, all the communication is done by uh, pushing JSON, JSONs over SSH. So what are the basic Ansible concepts? Well, first of all, there's the inventory. Okay, so we don't have agent nodes. So in order to, to know where, where our nodes are, we need some, some list of hosts, and that would be the inventory. Uh, Ansible allows us to run ad hoc commands, you know, just go to, to the list of hosts and perform some command. And uh, the configuration scenarios are called playbooks. And playbooks use modules in order to control system resources and execute commands. The modules, uh, Ansible comes uh, preloaded with quite a lot of modules, but you can always develop your own. And uh, the good thing is that these models can be written in any language. You could use bash scripting or even Windows batch, uh, as long as you uh, return a JSON that Ansible can understand. And uh, playbooks and accompanying data is uh, organized in roles. Uh, with AnsibleGalaxy.com, which is their role repository, holding more than 3,000 roles already, and this with uh, the project being very, very young. Okay, this is a sample of Ansible code. So this does more or less what the other two did. Uh, well, the difference here is you have to define what, what the hosts are for which this configuration is applicable. And you can see that it's YAML. It certainly looks simpler than Chef or Puppet. Regarding UI, you know, we only have the option of Ansible Tower, uh, their commercial offering. Uh, it uh, adds support for auto-scaling um, and role-based uh, access control. No other options. Uh, although with Reddit acquiring Ansible, we should probably expect them adding some tighter integration between Ansible and Foreman. Don't know when that happens. So Ansible in a nutshell is simple, as they uh, promise. Uh, lightweight, agentless. Uh, uh, I, I think this was left over from previous. Like the, the Windows support used to be very immature, but they've added a lot of functions in version 2.0, which came out about half a year ago. Uh, YAML DSL, it is very simple, but if you need more advanced use cases, like doing more procedural type things, uh, it can get tricky. Uh, and it using SSH uh, does uh, have imp implications on performance. Uh, 
especially when we compare it to the, our next contestant, which is SALT. Okay, SALT is uh, one year older than Ansible, but still younger than the, the other two. It's also written in Python as Ansible. It's developed by SaltStack Incorporated. Configuration is also uh, in YAML plus Jinja templating. And their motto is speed, scalability, and flexibility. Well, SALT is different than the, the other three because at its core, it's uh, simply a, a remote execution mechanism. And uh, that remote execution is based on a very performant uh, zero MQ. Uh, that's how SALT uh, agents, SALT nodes, which in SALT uh, uh, lingua are called minions, that's how they talk with the master. Um, well, it of course uh, allows us also masterless uh, uh, use case, but the typical setup would be master and minions. So master pushes configuration to the minions, and then they report back their state. Um, so in general, as I said, this is more at its core a remote execution mechanism, but it does allow you to use it as a desired state configuration management tool because it has the concept of states. Uh, so it, it starts with running simple commands. At salt master, you know what your, who your minions are and you can send them just a simple command with running salt and fighting the minions with the use of a, a wildcard or some pattern and uh, run modules on those. And salt modules are what control system resources and executes commands. The modules are written in Python or Cython. So again, if you already write Python, salt will be a good f fit for you. Um, there are formulas which allow you to group modules uh, to uh, define a specific uh, system functionality. And salt configuration scenarios are called, are called states, okay, in, in line with being a desired state configuration management uh, engine. And uh, in salt uh, language, facts about the, the managed nodes are called grains and their global access data is pillars, so uh, these are all uh, revolving around salt. Uh, and uh, community state trees and modules can be found on saltstarters.org. I, by looking at, at, the, at their site, I couldn't really understand how many states, community developed states are available there. And that probably says something uh, regarding their community support. Uh, okay, this is a sample of uh, salt code. So you can see it's a mix of uh, Jinja and YAML. Uh, regarding web UI, um, there is Salt Enterprise, which is their commercial offering, and there is also uh, an open source project called Molten, which uh, provi provides an easy way to to access Salt by REST API. By the way, Salt must. Yeah, the batteries, the batteries are running out, or I don't know, I don't know why that's happening. Okay, so salt in a nutshell, it is fast. It does uh, perform on the promise of being fast. It is according to what the yeah, we need it. Need a solution for failing microphones. Okay, can you hear me? 
Okay, good. So uh, it is very easily extendable. You know, it being at the core remote execution mechanism, there are a lot of uh, different use uh, cases and scenarios you could apply to SALT. Uh, it could be more or less than a configuration management tool. You can use it just as a node management or remote execution or telemetry collecting uh, mechanism inside your own application because it uh, at the base is just a, a Python module and it has a Python API that you could use in your own software. Uh, it works in push mode by default. It is in active development, but uh, still uh, the documentation on their site is probably uh, far from perfect and that again shows in for example me not being able to uh, to get any data regarding the amount of available salt states on on their state repository okay so to sum things up uh, Go with Puppet if you want its features, uh, its wider choice of web UI options, uh, its maturity and its wider ecosystem. Uh, you could say that it's probably a bit better for devs. Okay, take this with a pinch of salt, decide for yourself. I'm trying to be as objective as, as possible. Uh, go with Chef, Chef if uh, you want its flexibility and if you already have some Ruby mileage behind. It's probably also better for developers because it certainly uh, requires quite a bit more coding than the other tools. Uh, go with Ansible if you want simplicity, if you want something that's agentless and as a result much easier to set up. Uh, YAML and Python, probably better for ops people. Uh, Although we do want tools that allow devs and ops to communicate. Uh, so, and regarding salt, if you want scalability and flexibility and performance and you like Python, go with salt. Uh, could we say that probably salt is better for both sides? I don't know, but uh, it could be something to think about. Uh, how do we decide if we don't use a tool yet or if we're considering switching a tool? Well, what I usually do, I do take a small task that uh, I've been doing manually or that my current tool doesn't handle very well and that's a task that I'm really sick of and I try to slay it with which each one of the weapons. Uh, I'd say start with Ansible because it's certainly easier than the other three. Uh, write down your impressions and share with the world. Okay, uh, I'm suggesting a, a hashtag here that's called Ninja Weapons. And the most important things, stop breaking your teeth. <laughs>